Starting lines are all hope and nerves. Starting at, or standing at my starting line, the San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon, the nerves felt much more present. I ran a half marathon in a little under two hours. It was pretty fun, actually. And, you know, 13.1 more miles isn't really that much more to run after you just ran 13.1 miles, right? I set a goal of finishing in under four hours. I felt prepared for all of it. My thoughts focused on my feet landing under my hips, getting a good strong push all the way through my big toe. Pat, 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 pat. Letting my breathing dictate my cadence. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Don't push too hard to where I'm breathing through my mouth or I trigger the fight or flight response. No point in registering for a fight unless I have to. I bounced around to keep my legs warm, triple checked my laces and did a mental inventory of my bladder. I was ready, probably. I looked around and laughed a little. Nervous about battling a crowd of people like myself at the starting line, I registered in the three hour crowd. Everyone was in much better shape than I was and, we were going, and they were going to have to run around me to keep their <laughs> pace going. The starting line for my mom's journey with colon cancer is also all hope and nerves. After my mom was diagnosed, she sat in a room, gave a blood sample, watched a nurse take her vitals and waited for the IV full of poison. There was no half chemo the year before, no warm up. She sat there full of hope and nerves, reading through a pamphlet they handed her and wondering what side effects she would battle. If she believed what she said, she had a lot more hope to beat this thing than I did to crack that four hour mark. By the third mile, I was finally able to settle into a rhythm. The race day pump made me sprint out to a fast start. Then the people from the next few waves who didn't lie on their registration blew right by me. <laughs> I fell into my pace and instantly a calm came over me. My feet became lighter and bouncier. My training was regimented. I pushed myself hard. I was in my mid-twenties. Work ended at 2.30 every day and I was still trying to convince my future wife that I was an elite athlete. <laughs> During the week, I pushed the speed on the shorter runs, slowly upping the distance but trying to hold a fast pace. Weekends were for the slow burns, long runs where the goal was to keep good form and build up that mental stamina. These runs taught me all about what spots would start chafing, what aches and pains I would be able to anticipate afterwards. They also taught me to be thankful for the fact that my nipples tended to stay pretty relaxed when I went for a run in the cold. <laughs> One of the ways I pushed myself through the longer training runs was thinking about my mom's pain. I would never run with music or anything else in my ears because I wanted to feel the weight of my breath. When it got heavy, I would compare it to the weight that she carried. The drag you down and not let go kind of weight. I would hold it close to me for a few intimate moments and then blow it out with a few hard breaths. The tunnel vision would clear and the mud I thought I was running in would turn back into concrete. Some of the best stories told about my mom were about her pregnancies with me and my siblings. I'm the oldest. Hats do not fit this head. As my aunts gathered in the waiting room to celebrate me, screams came from down the hall like nobody in the hospital had ever heard. The nurses looked alarmed. In the end, after some vacuuming and forceps got involved, I was here and rocking a nice black eye to greet the world. I st <laughs> I still have a nice dimple on that side of my face from the trauma. And it only got easier from there. My brother and sister are twins, and they were both over seven pounds. Her belly was a torpedo that was launching away from the rest of her body. I love those pregnancy pictures where mothers-to-be are eating cereal on the couch with the bowl on their belly. My mom did that standing up. And you know how twins usually pop out a minute or two apart? Nah, 22 minutes extra time in this one. My mom was a volleyball player and a coach. She had more patience than anyone 
when she was teaching you something or watching you figure out your life. But if you stepped on the court, it was pure intensity. I remember her legs, they were so strong. She was pure power coming from the outside. Her kills record at the University of New Mexico stood for a while after she was gone. I got to be a part of my mom's routine once. After several rounds of chemo, the unknown was gone. She knew how many days she would spend in bed or on the bathroom floor before she could go back to work teaching. True to her style, there, was never, there has never been anyone to throw up at a higher decibel level than her. <laughs> if you were nearby, you knew when she was sick. She was battling with neuropathy in her fingers and toes. You know that tingling feeling you get when your arm falls asleep? But all the time. On this day, I got to take her to her chemo appointment. I was nervous about it. Most of our conversations about her cancer to this point were about side effects, about maintaining normal. This was putting the cancer right in her face and making us sit with it until the IV bag ran empty. It was her fourth or fifth time in this building, but she knew the people who worked there. She smiled and greeted everyone with a small remembrance of their last conversation. She told me about one nurse who hula hooped down in La Jolla in her free time. She had seen videos and told me it was way cooler than it sounded. <laughs> and the appointment floated by easily. She brought me into the conversations. She kept on going with the staff and patients around her. She asked questions of the people she was meeting the first time. It was always about everyone else around her. She hid the pain and resentment, knowing that when she left, the next few days would be awful. As soon as we got into the car, she laid down across the back seat and fell asleep. <clears throat> At the halfway point of my race, things could not have felt better. As I made a turn near Mission Bay, I saw it only took me one hour and 42 minutes. Guys, I was flying. <laughs> that was 10 minutes faster than my marathon the year before. And I still felt like I had a lot of energy left in my reserves. The halfway point for my mom was all smiles too. She was declared cancer free. One of the funnier moments I remember shortly after this was going to Chili's on some random weeknight. My mom was excited about it in a way that nobody is excited about eating at Chili's. <laughs> when we walked in, she quickly ordered a Coors Light. I do not have a lot of memories where my mom was drinking, but on this day, when an ice-cold silver bullet came to our table in a frosty mug, ooh, she was happy. Now, if by chance you're familiar with the San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon, you know that as I was making a turn near Mission Bay and coming back towards downtown, I would soon be running down the exit ramp of the 163 northbound and running up the hill from Fashion Valley into Hillcrest. I plead with you, everyone, the next time you are on this stretch of road, take a closer look at how steep that stupid fucking freeway is. <laughs> By the time I made it up the hill, I was done. I thought I had found out all the places that could hurt. I was wrong. My hips were a brand new surprise on this day, a dull pain that grew and grew as my pace slowed. This was the time I had planned for. This was the fight I signed up for, to face the pain. All the way up that hill, I channeled everything I remembered my mom going through. At one point, I let out a guttural noise that can't quite be described as a scream or a yell or anything else. It definitely turned some heads. The image of my aunts in the waiting room flashed in my head, and the next 10 steps were a little easier. Slogging through another mile, even with a stitch in my side and sore hips, I would never compare to what she went through. Somewhere deep down, I knew this all along. But I had put off dealing with it until I had five miles left to run, and my tank was completely empty. My grief felt broken. I was reaching for something that I would never be able to grab. The violence of conjuring her pain to help push myself was not buying me more time with her, and it definitely wasn't shaving any time off my mile splits. 
The easy part was long gone for both of us. By this section of her marathon, the cancer had come back. Her run up to 163 was a hell of a lot steeper than mine. She had switched hospitals, entered an experimental research trial, and was now preparing for chemo bowl surgery. Basically, the cancer was everywhere in her abdomen, so the idea was open her up, splash in a bunch of radioactive poison, swish it around a few times, and hope her body would react well to it. I sat with her in a hospital room one day. Her body was different now. It showed signs of her battle. Her legs had grown thin, the muscle gone, a part of her gone with them. The days of rising above a volleyball net, a distant memory. Still, the conversations were the same. She told me about the resident who was still learning the ropes but taking good care of her. She asked me about everything going on in my life. Then there was a peek behind the, the armor. They needed a tissue sample from her lungs and would be inserting a needle between her ribs to gather it. It all seemed pretty routine to me at that point. And in the midst of all the other things on her mind, my mom gave this small task little energy. But when the resident was completing the biopsy, there was a mishap. When he pulled out the needle, it got caught. The calm in the room immediately left. The look on her face of shock and pain is etched into my memory forever. It was so unfair. I held her hand tightly at first, but soon I was lying next to her in the hospital bed as the attending doctor came to remedy the situation. At mile 23, I felt like I was close to the end, but had to slow to a walk for minutes at a time. Every time, spotting a light post or water station ahead, telling myself to pick it back up when I got there. The pain had won, and accepting that felt like it was letting my mom drift a little further away from me. My mom began hospice care after everything her doctors tried to do for her just wasn't working. She told us it was just a break from the hospital rooms, a temporary move. Her stomach had once again bloomed. Some awful mix of chemo, cancer, scarring, and everything else in her stomach left it looking like she was bringing life into this world again. Friends and family came to visit from everywhere. My dad got a tattoo. She laughed while holding her stomach during conversations again. She balanced a cup of yogurt on it while watching TV. I realized pain is not the finish line. Not being able to stand up to the pain was so much worse than having hips that didn't work anymore. Time slips away from us, whether you are trying to shave off a few minutes or hold on for a few more days. I still run without music, but now I don't wait for the pain to come to feel alive. Running helped bring her close to me for a little bit longer. I stumbled slowly across the finish line, the loudspeaker blaring as cheers as it cheers people through the final straightaway. The course is lined with families and friends clapping. Even though my mom has already crossed her finish line, I swear I can still hear her screaming from down the hall. Ryan Horton, ladies and gentlemen. Ryan Horton.